Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Leatherface. No, not the 2017 prequel. This one is Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3 and came out in 1990. TCM 3 is possibly the most forgettable entry in the series, despite featuring horror legend Ken Foray and professional hobbit bodyguard Viggo Mortensen. This threequel pretty much ignores the continuity established in the first two films. Although Leatherface returns, now played by a new actor, R.A. Mihailo, off, the other Sawyers we see are total goddamn strangers. There's all of a sudden a mom, a trio of new brothers, and a little girl running around who's apparently meant to be Leatherface's daughter. That's messed up on a number of levels. Texas Chainsaw 3 was meant to be a back-to-basics horror film in contrast to the zany dark comedy that was part 2. It was the first of the series to have a decently big studio behind it with New Line Cinema, but that also leaves it feeling a bit more commercial to me, as opposed to the gritty home made feel of the first two Chainsaw films. It doesn't help that it's so censored. When the MPAA threatened this one with an X rating, just like they did for part two, the producers made director Jeff Burr cut the movie down so it could better make back its budget. That's a damn shame when you've got makeup by Greg Nicotero, who's done everything from The Walking Dead to Casino Royale. What's left in the film is mostly boring characters running around in the woods at night, mixed with some of the same shit we already saw in the first two movies. It's not the worst thing I've ever seen, but man, does it fail to leave an impression. How many kills will this all-new Sawyer family deliver on their hand-me-down dinner plates? Let's find out and get to them. The movie begins, as is tradition by now, with a title crawl talking about the events of the first film, but now mentioning that Sally Hardesty died in 1977. Don't take that to heart though, cause it won't still be true by the end of the next movie. We get our first kill right off the bat, when we see a girl named Gina screaming in slow motion before she gets hit in the face by a title card, or a sledgehammer. She was hit in the face with a sledgehammer, and it left a nasty hole in her head. Gina's sister Sarah watches from outside a window as Leatherface works at his craft table, busy as a bee making another human face mask. Maybe he's just been misinterpreting a skincare routine this whole time. When Sarah makes a noise, Leatherface hears it and sets out on a haunt with a reference to the first film. Sometime later, an ill-fated couple is driving through Texas with their relationship on its last fumes. Final girl Michelle is getting ready to travel abroad by herself, meaning she's about to break up with her boyfriend Ryan, who's played by William Butler. Last seen on the kill count, way back in Friday the 13th Part 7, when Kane Hodder Jason killed him with a tent spike to the back. Good times. They spend the day driving on the shoulder of the road and drinking old cans of Pepsi, and when night comes, they're stopped by a police blockade at a crime scene. Oh, and hey, it looks like Stretch managed to become a real reporter after all. Judging by this blink and you miss it cameo from Caroline Williams. We love you, Stretch, come back! The crime scene consists of waterlogged corpses that the police take pictures of, giving us that flashbulb sound effect from the original. Judging by all the bodies we see, this area has been Sawyerfied. So a cop tells Michelle and Ryan that they'd better not stop for nothing or nobody. But after driving straight through the night, they've got as much gas in their tank as they do longevity in their relationship. So they have no choice but to stop at the last chance gas station. As Ryan goes to the bathroom, Michelle gets her picture taken by gas station employee Alfredo, who tries to push the photo on her for five bucks, which yes, is exactly what the hitchhiker did back in the first movie. Michelle declines the offer, sending Alfredo into a muttery rant full of sexual harassment. You don't like it? Mm -hmm. You like me, don't you? <laughs> Michelle does not like Alfredo. She's more of a pesto kind of gal. But she's saved from this uncomfortable encounter by Tex, a hitchhiker played by Vigo Mortensen, who somehow manages to be charming while talking about some roadkill that Michelle had caused earlier. You're the last thing I saw before I died. I die happy man. Ryan gets back from the bathroom and feels appropriately threatened by Vigo and his dirty cowboy getup. <laughs> yeah, sorry pal, but your girl looks like she wants to be the next Arwen. But first she has to go use the bathroom, and while she does, pervy Alfredo spies on her through a hole in the wall. Once again her virtue is saved by Tex, who stops Alfredo by throwing him out of his own establishment. You shut the fuck up motherfucker, in my place! Alfredo boils over and grabs a shotgun that he uses to chase the kids out of his station. As they drive away, he shoots out 
out their back window, and then they see him shoot at Tax. Holy fuck, he dusted him! Did you say dusted? Dusted's not a thing. Dusted who? Yo, quit acting like dusted's a thing. They turn down a road that Tex had told them about earlier, maybe it was in the Green Book or something, and start looking for a town with some law enforcement that can help them. But by time night comes, they're still driving, with no civilization in sight. Real nice shot there, by the way. Good work, Director Jeff Bird, who actually got this movie kind of by default after it was offered to and turned down by seemingly every other director in Hollywood, including Peter Jackson. This souped-up pickup truck also wants to do some dusk driving, so it takes off from the Last Chance gas station while Alfredo cheers it on with gunfire. The truck catches up to the kids, and its leather-adorned hood confuses the acting out of Ryan. Oh my god, what do they want from us? They want to throw animals at your windshield, son. Which they do, causing Michelle and Ryan to drive off the road and pop a tire. While Ryan tries to fix it, a squeaking sound informs them that somebody else is nearby. Wonder who it could be. It's Leatherface. In this movie, he's sporting that leg brace and a brand new mask, but I actually kind of dig this grungier makeover. They manage to hit Leatherface with their car and get away, but shortly down the road, they wind up in the most poorly edited car crash sequence I've ever seen, when they apparently run into Ken Foray's character Benny after an insane looking text jumps out into the road. <laughs> Wait, what? Were those cars even on the same road? We literally never saw them together in the same shot. Not once. I think we just got bamboozled. Both cars are completely totaled, but lucky for Michelle and Ryan, Benny happens to be a survivalist who's more than prepared to help them through the rest of this movie. Ryan tries to tell him about the chainsaw attack, but Benny chalks the claim up to shock and sarcastically dismisses it. Militant lumberjacks. See him all the time. Then he gives them some mmm drugs, which both of them take without question. Great survival instincts there, idiots. Benny ends up buying their chainsaw story after getting a look at their car, but by that point, the painkillers are kicking in and causing Michelle and Ryan to start feeling a little woozy there, man. Benny leaves his new passed out friends to return to the crash site, where he finds a dude sporting road flares and a hook for a hand. Looks like you had a little mishap. Huh, I wonder if this guy's a Sawyer. Oh, yep, definitely a Sawyer. Benny asks this dude named Tinker for some help, but after noticing that Tink's got a chainsaw in the back of his truck, he very smartly runs back to his Jeep to get a gun. He takes too long loading it, though, causing Tink to grow suspicious and drive at him in another pretty cool shot. He just barely misses Benny, but lucky for Tinker, Leatherface is here to pick up the slack. He might have killed Benny, too, with his little Texas bone saw, if it wasn't for that Sarah chick from the beginning, randomly yelling out and distracting Leatherface away. Sarah runs around giggling through the woods before doubling back to Benny, who asks a very pertinent question. Who the hell are you? She says that she's a survivor from a previous attack by the Sawyers, but don't get too attached to her. She's really only here to add to the kills. Back near the crash site, Ryan and Kim wake up from their drug nap and recite some epically bad, like, high school play quality lines. Where's that goddamn sunrise? This is gonna have to be for now, come on. They head into the woods and call out Benny's name, causing Benny to leave Sarah for a mo so he can go find them. Hope she's enjoying that final cigarette, cause here comes Leatherface! He knows why Sarah's in this movie, so he makes his offering to the Kill Count gods by taking his chainsaw and cutting into her torso with it. Damn, what an unnecessary character. And while there's a decent amount of blood spray going on, this kill, like all the others, was severely cut down. Originally, Sarah was supposed to get cut in high out. After what feels like hours of the characters just walking through the woods, Leatherface finds Michelle and Ryan, and while trying to escape him, Ryan gets caught in a bear trap. Michelle tries to help him to no avail, and as she's running away to save herself, Leatherface catches up to Ryan and introduces him to his chainsaw. Michelle comes across a house, and we all know who's gonna be inside. A bunch of cannibalistic murder- Oh, hey, it's a little girl. That's different. This little girl, who Michelle follows upstairs, is played by Jennifer Banco, who, just like William Butler was also in Friday the 13th Part 7, where she played the younger version of Tina, the Carrie ripoff. Remember? She actually kicked off that kill count when she accidentally killed her dad. In this movie, her character's purposefully violent, and also an aspiring ventriloquist. Don't talk yep, turns out she's a nasty evil Sawyer, just like Tex. Yeah, we all knew that was coming. Strider never was good at lying about his identity. Tex nails Michelle's hands into a chair so this movie can try to have its own dinner scene. They've even got the corpse of Grandpa to join them. I mean, they kinda have to, it's tradition. And Grandpa is the best at killing. But there's also a new type of character to this movie's Sawyer family. I mean, besides a little girl. It's a motherly figure, Mama Ann, who's confined to a wheelchair and speaks through a voice box. You best shut 
come first. Tinker gets home with Ryan's body, which he and his brother Tex hang up in a manner referencing an infamous crime scene photo of Ed Gein's victim Bernice Warden. While Ryan's hanging out, we get some Sawyer family character development. Looks like Tex has a nasty temper if he's called by his real name Eddie, and Tinker is apparently the brains of this operation who's obsessed with modern technology. Also, Tinker is played by Joe Unger, who was one of John Saxton's sheriffs in the original Nightmare on Elm Street. He was the one Nancy yelled at when she came to the station to check on Rob. They realize that Ryan is still alive, which should have been clear to anyone paying attention to the kill count, and then they tell Leatherface, called Junior in this movie, that they have a gift for him. And why, holy goddamn, it's a fucking golden chainsaw, with a Drayton Sawyer quote engraved on it, no less. I've heard that the idea for this came from Bob Shea, the executive at New Line, who was all over the Nightmare series, and who even cameoed as himself in the meta New Nightmare. Kids love horror. Gotta hand it to him, that thing is the coolest damn killing machine I have ever seen. It's almost as cool as the one my YouTube managers made in sent me for getting 2 million subscribers. Thanks y'all, you the best. During all this, Alfredo, the other brother, has been disposing of bodies in a swamp while Benny watches from afar. Because the Benster's trained as a survivalist, he's able to sneak up behind Alfredo and stick a gun in his face. Although it doesn't seem to phase the little noodly Sawyer. Do I know you? Maybe not, Fredo, but that doesn't mean you can just spit in the dude's face. Benny knocks Alfredo into the body disposal swamp and considers it a job well done. Wonder. Don't be so sure, Benny. Do you see any kill graphics on the screen? Yeah, I didn't think so. Benny sneaks his way to the house, where he looks into a window and sees Leatherface working on his education. His lessons come from a computer that asks him to identify objects such as a clown, but poor little Junior here only knows people as food, and he just can't come up with any alternate answers. <laughs> It's pretty funny, kind of adorable, and maybe my favorite moment in the movie. Leatherface eventually gives up and returns to the kitchen with the rest of his family. Unlike Drayton and the twins, these Sawyers are pretty supportive of each other, and are downright affectionate when it comes to pivotal moments like the little girl's first kill. She uses a contraption that Tinker's rigged up to automate the killing process, and with it, she kills Ryan by dropping a sledgehammer into his head from above. It's another kill that was severely cut for censors, although we do get to see the little girl collecting Ryan's blood for some grandpa juice. You did such a good job with that kill, little girl. You just earned yourself a Leatherface kiss. Mwah. This is the scene where we get a clue into the little girl's identity when Tex threatens Michelle with rape from Leatherface. He does make sweet damn babies, you know. Again, that is all sorts of fucked up, since what, the little girl is apparently Leatherface's daughter begotten from another victim's rape? Hey, Texas Chainsaw series, you don't need that additional depravity, man. The Sawyers already eat people, that's bad enough. Leatherface revs up his coolest kill award, and the noise gets Benny's attention, so he decides to openly fire into the house, cause like, screw Michelle's safety, right? Various injuries are sustained, including fingers and ears being blown off, and during the mayhem, Michelle manages to tear herself free and run out of the house. Leatherface chases after her, which is apparently enough to finally evoke some personality out of this final girl. Okay. All right. You and me then, huh? You sick. Yo, where was this energy the first hour of the movie, when your character was putting me to sleep? Inside the house, a terminal tink tells Tex to go get that meat, before he and Mama Sawyer apparently die. Mama's an easy one to add to the count, since she did get shot a whole bunch by Benny. But even though Tinker appeared to only lose some non-vital appendages, we never see him again, so eh, fuck it. Outside, Tex winds up in a fight with Benny, who misses him with an axe swing and tears open a tank of gasoline instead. Tex ends up getting covered in that gasoline, so although he's got the little girl cheering him on from the window, he's no match for the power of fire that Benny tosses his way. Tex goes up in flames for a pretty decent fire stunt and runs around looking like goddamn Denethor while Benny stumbles away like a clumsy action movie hero guy. Aw, oh, I knew I shouldn't have bet two hundo on Tex. In the woods, Michelle is still being chased by Leatherface and almost gets killed by him before Benny shows up and tackles him into a swamp. They fight for a while while the still running chainsaw sticks out above the surface, much like it did in the Excalibur-inspired trailer for this movie. Damn, if only the film could have lived up to that commercial. Leatherface wins the showdown in the bayou by pushing Benny into the chainsaw's whirring blade. With her champion vanquished, Michelle goes to leave, only for a waterlogged Leatherface to jump out and stop her. But she's totally snapped by now, and just beats that boy with a rock until he sinks down below the surface. Morning comes, and Michelle makes it out to a road. No sooner has she sit on that monster truck tire bus stop bench that the Sawyer's truck driver
heads up to her, with Benny behind the wheel. Originally, Benny was killed in the swamp, but they redid the ending after they found that test audiences really liked his character. No shit they liked him, it's Ken freaking 4A. The two of them hug, and that's nice, but then Benny gets knocked the fuck out by that mofo Alfredo. It's knock knock time and love it, and I'm back! <laughs> Wait, I'm sorry, what did you say? It's knock knock time and love it, and I'm back! Once again, I didn't catch that, but we can just move on. He attacks the truck with a sledgehammer, but Michelle grabs the shotgun in the cab and points it at him through the back. He gambles that she doesn't know how to use the gun, but she proves him wrong and shoots him dead. Whatever you want to say about him, you can't call him a chicken, that Alfredo. The movie ends with Michelle and Benny driving away in the truck, while the still living Leatherface walks into frame and watches them go. Come back soon! How many people were killed by Texas Fellowship of the Saw? Let's find out at the numbers. By my count, seven people died in Leatherface TCM3, even if, again, not all of them were confirmed. The victims included four men and three women, giving us a more even pie chart than usual, and with a runtime of 85 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 12.14 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw to Leatherface's golden chainsaw. It's not a kill, and come to think of it, he never even uses it to successfully kill anyone, but most of these deaths are too cut down to be award winners. And this thing is literally a golden chainsaw. What the fuck do you want me to do? Doll Machete for Lamest Kill will go to Gina, who was hit in the head just off screen with a sledgehammer. Been there and seen that. And that's it. Leatherface, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, came out in 1990 and was the only installment of the series released by New Line Cinema. They're probably glad they don't have their name on part 4, because the next generation is a mess. We'll look at that next week, but until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this week's Kill Count. I want to thank some patrons like David Fonseca, Ms. Eggy, Gary Story, and Dylan Fletcher. Although this movie wasn't anything special, it's way better than The Next Generation. Next weekend, I'll be at Texas Frightmare, so if you're going, let me know. I definitely want to meet as many fans as possible. I'm also excited to see and hang out with my mods. See y'all there. Thanks, everybody. Be good people.